our nation's enterprise, the story of Ireland at work, presented by Jack White. The carriage awaits. a.m. Kingsbridge. The express for Cork is pulling out of the station. Within minutes she'll be slipping between the houses of the outer suburbs. As the passengers eat their breakfast, open their papers, light their pipes, she'll be streaking across the pastures of Kildare and Tipperary. In three hours time, on the dot, she'll pull into the Glanmire station Cork. The locomotive you heard wasn't of course one of the puffing monsters that fascinated us all in our youth but a big grey and yellow diesel. Not so romantic, I suppose, but clean and efficient. In a way, you can take it as a symbol of the new CIE, the Irish National Transport Service. But here's another symbol, and a pleasanter one. A pretty girl in a smart blue uniform. Mary Brennan is a rail hostess on the Cork Express, and she told me what her rather unusual job consists of. To be quite frank, my duties are all embracing. They reach out to every passenger. Uh, we specialise primarily uh, for mothers with children. If they are travelling with their children, we offer to look after them while parents have a meal, or we heat the baby's bottle, or we prepare it, and we also prepare baby's food and feed the babies. Oh, what a, what a very welcome service. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, but we also look after the tourists, and we do our best to make our foreign visitors feel at home in our country, and we supply them with information in regard to bus and rail connections, places of interest that they could visit. Do you get many foreign visitors? We do, this run? Uh, quite a few. Uh, but I'd say the majority of them are Americans who have Irish ancestors, and they're coming back to see the place of their forefathers. What sort of things do they ask about? Oh, they ask the most, some of them are really unusual questions, but the majority of them are pretty well um, rail, bus connections, where they can visit, what they can see, and uh, what amenities the hotels offer. Mm. And you must have a pretty comprehensive knowledge of Ireland yourself. Yes, well, I think it's one of the things you really need. You want to know every corner of the country, be literally on nodding terms with every hill and mountain. <laughs> <laughs> what other qualities do you think you need for this job? Well, I should say tact and patience. Tact, most important. And the ability to put yourself across to your passengers to make them feel at home. Now, here we are in Cork, and let's have a word with the man who brought us there. Martin Fogarty, who comes from Tipperary, is a veteran at the game, as I discovered when I asked him how long he'd been driving trains. 22 years. So you were on steam trains before you went on to diesels? Yes, I was on steam trains, yes. Is it a very different job? On the, on the diesels? Mm -hmm. Well, no. It's not. It's not as uh, it's not troublesome or anything like that. Uh, but of course, on the steam, you had to use a lot of head work. You see. Yes. But on these, you see, you just go if you're lucky. It's just straightforward, really. Uh, yes. It? Yes. Mm. But on the steam, of course, you had to be watching water and banks and everything like that. Yes. Well, which would you prefer to drive? Well, now they come a bit late for me. <laughs> the diesels. You yes. know, they're an, an easy job and a nice job and a clean job, but they come a bit late in my time, you know. Yes. See, I had to work very hard before these come here. So you really think of yourself as a steam man who's just yes. taking these on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, how long do you take for that journey from, from Dublin? Uh, well, the running time is three hours. For a distance of? Uh, 165 and a half. So you're uh, running, uh, you're averaging around about, what, 55? About 55 to 60 an miles an hour. What's the maximum speed you hit on that one? Well, the parts of the road will do 75 miles an hour. The initials CIE stand for Chorus Imper Aeron, which means the Irish Transport Service. And now let's go back and see just how this huge organisation originated. I was told the background by Mr Frank Lamass, the general manager. Historically, in 1945, uh, an act was passed to uh, nationalise the public transport service in the country. That was due, of course, to the fact that under private enterprise, the railways were not able to continue to be a viable undertaking because of the losses that were being sustained. And what is the point of having a national transport undertaking of this kind, covering road and rail services? The need to provide these social services of public transport for passengers and freight. 
when you speak of social services, then this isn't necessarily a completely commercial undertaking. Oh, no. The, 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 the primary object of CIE is to provide a, a service to the public, the public uh, transport service. You have come under some criticism for the closing down of branch lines to some places. Don't you think that conflicts with your role as a public service? Not at all, no. The, uh, in any case where we've closed a branch line, we have provided alternative road services, which we uh, consider are equally efficient as the rail services and generally uh, more efficient. And do you plan to go ahead with that, uh, with the closing down of railway lines? We're, with the closure of the West Cork Railway, the board have decided that for the balance of its term, which expires in March 64, that there will not be any further closing of branch lines. So you're really going to stabilise the system as it now stands? For the present. Can you give me some idea of the scale of CIE's operations? Mm, Passenger-wise, uh, we carry an average of 300 million passengers on our bus services and about 11 to 12 million, nearly 12 million on our rail services. Every year? Every year. The staff is, uh, staff employed is um, on average 21,000 and uh, we are the biggest employer in the country and the biggest management executive in the country. How can you uh, test the efficiency of an organization of this kind, a, a monopoly organization like CIE? Well, the, uh, the, the test is the acceptance of our services by the public. If the public regard our services as reasonable uh, and economic, then that is the test. As far as we're concerned, uh, our aim is to provide services to the public which will be uh, efficient, safe, economic, fast. Now, in your advertising campaigns, you throw a good deal of stress on the idea of the new CIE. What idea have you in mind when you put this forward? In 1958, there was a Transport Act passed which provided certain reliefs for us which we didn't have heretofore. They were mainly uh, commercial reliefs in that we could carry goods where, when, and how we liked without any restrictions. We could even refuse to carry goods if we so wanted. Um, this Act also eliminated the old railway tribunal to whom we had to apply in any case where we wanted to close a branch line. Now, uh, further, the, the Act did give us uh, a fixed subsidy of money for a term of five years and, and uh, made it clear that at the end of the five years there'd be no more subsidy. Now, all this was a tremendous challenge to us, which we were glad to accept. The uh, freedom on the commercial side had all the ingredients of a plan uh, to produce package deals, which have been most successful. The removal of the transport tribunal made uh, more easy the, the closing of on economic branch lines. And of course, this, uh, this need to break even at the end of five years was the uh, incentive for us to make ourselves as efficient as possible. Now, uh, are you pleased with the financial progress that you've managed to make to date? Yes, quite pleased, because when the, the new CIE, that is the CIE which was created under the, the 1958 Act, uh, was set up, uh, we were losing at the rate of £2 million a year. In the first full year of our operations, which was for the year end of March 1960, we had managed to reduce that figure to a deficit of £700,000. And for the last year, as the year end of March 61, we managed to reduce that further to a figure of just about a quarter of a million. And we hope to keep up this uh, good work until we achieve our goal, which is a break-even position. By the year? Well, not, not later than March 64. To increase efficiency, CIE has divided the country into five administrative areas. Mr. William O'Neill is area manager for the Waterford area, and he told me about his responsibilities. Well, I'm responsible for the entire running of CIE within my area. Which constitutes? If you take a line from Gorey up to Athai, down through Clonmel and Capaquin to the estuary of the Blackwater. Uh, we have gathered that this system is more efficient from the point of view of CIE. What advantages does it bring to the user of transport, the people in your area? Well, area management is really personal management. Uh, in each area, we have responsible officials on the spot who can make decisions and deal with any complaints from our customers who are the public. Does the system of area divisions and area management have any benefit from the staff point of view? The major benefit of area management to the staff is that 
the staff are in immediate contact with management. Management is more aware of the individual abilities of the staff due to the fact that the management units are smaller. How many areas of management are there? There are five areas with headquarters in Dublin, Cork, Galway, Limerick and Waterford. But the actual traffic movement then is organised in uh, collaboration with the traffic control in Dublin? Yes, with the transport control and planning unit because you will understand that in the matter of timetables and extra rolling stock which may be required to meet particular needs, there must be a central controlling unit because any alteration in a timetable can affect all the areas in the country. The central control of services is provided from Dublin by the Transport Control and Planning Officer and Mr Ned O'Flaherty, who holds this job, explained it to me. There must be a coordination of the operating activities of all areas to ensure optimum utilisation of the board's resources uh, combined with an efficient service to the public. In short, I suppose you could say my main function is, main function of my unit, to provide in conjunction with the area managers the right amount of equipment at the right time and in the right place to meet the needs of the public. In addition to that, uh, one must constantly watch is the level of equipment right for the future. In fact, it is true to say we must keep in very close touch with the economic and social life of the community. Mr O'Flaherty went on to explain how his department keeps in constant touch with rail services all over the country. At this very moment, uh, there is an Amin Street, a central control operating, which, a central control which operates over the 24 hours, uh, plotting all over the system uh, train movement. And then suppose that uh, you have originally laid out a, a timetable, which means that trains connect with one another, that they run in sequence and so on. Uh, suppose that something goes wrong, are you, do you then have to sort it out? Suppose a train runs later, for instance, do you have to sort out the complications that arise? Oh yes, and it is then really that control becomes invaluable. The transport business isn't just a matter of providing a service. The service has to be sold to the public, and this is where the commercial manager, Mr P.G. Byrne, comes in. As commercial manager, it's my responsibility to uh, earn the revenue for the company, for the, for the board, apart from the uh, hotels uh, section of the board's uh, operations. That covers railway freight and passenger services and road freight and passenger services, exclusive of the Dublin City services. In other words, uh, other people provide the transport service and your job then is to go out and sell it to the public. Yes, that is true and of course in order to sell the service we must have it as attractive as possible so it is my responsibility to see that the people providing the service provide it in a fashion which will appeal to the public. In the sphere of passenger transport you're selling really against the private motorist, is that right? In competition with that, what do you offer? Uh, you offer, for example, a fast express to Cork. Do you find that that persuades people to travel by rail instead of going by car? Yes, undoubtedly. And there are a number of factors in that. Uh, first of all, you've mentioned the speed factor. In the second place, we are improving the standard of comfort of our trains. Indeed, we have reached a very high standard of comfort at the moment, and we have introduced on the Cork run uh, what we call named trains, which provide a high standard of speed and comfort. And there's another factor, that with the increasing number of cars on the road, and the increasing congestion, particularly in the cities, uh, people uh, consider, if the service is attractive, travelling by train when they haven't got the problem of parking and so forth in the cities. But have you been thinking of any new ideas for increasing the volume of traffic on your transport? Oh yes, indeed. During the, during the past two years we have developed very considerably in that respect. For example, perhaps the, most, the, the one which has got the most prominence has been the development of our educational tours. Now in uh, 1959 we carried 12,000 children on educational tours. 
But in 1960, because we went into the promotion of that traffic in a big way, we increased that to over 92,000. Do coach tours come within your sphere? Oh, yes. Coach tours, both in the sense of extended coach tours, that's the six, eight, uh, nine, 12-day tours, and day tours. We have done a great deal of promotional work on these tours during the past two years. If I might mention the extended tours in particular, uh, during 1960, we increased our carryings in these tours by over a thousand passengers. This year, I hope we'll increase, we'll increase the carrying still further by, I hope, in, perhaps an additional 2,000. A favourite stop for all coach tours, of course, is Killarney. And Dennis Collins, the well-known hall porter at the Great Southern Hotel, told me something about his visitors. Out of every 100 guests we get in this hotel, I can say at least 60% of them are Americans. And uh, in every coach party that does arrive, we can say we can find at least between 12 Australians or 12 New Zealanders on them, like yes. that is the average of six yes. in, in each side, you see. But what draws the rest, all these people to Killarney? Well, the most, uh, what I understand that draws them to Killarney is the, first and foremost, uh, the hotel itself has a wonderful name for uh, its food and its uh, homely atmosphere. And, and secondly, for the, one, for the tours we offer to them, such as the lakes of Killarney, on those Irish jaunting cars, and over the gap of Dunlow, on the ponies, or on Governor's cart, and down over the lakes by boat. What do you think the people look forward to most coming back to Ireland? Is it the scenery or is it the reception that they get from the people here? Well, I could say, first and foremost, it's the reception they receive from the people. And secondly, for its scenery. Because they do speak about the reception that you get in Ireland in the hotels and the staff. From Mr Joe Lucy, hotel's manager, I got the general story of the hotel chain. There are seven hotels in all. Uh, Starting in Kerry, Park Nasilla, Kenmare, Killarney, Galway, in the west, Mulrenny and Sligo and Bundoran. They're sometimes thought of as being rather a relic of the Victorian period of expansion of the railways. Um, and do you th uh, have you done a lot, much to keep them abreast of the times? Yes, we have modernised our hotels a great deal in the last, particularly in the last 12 years. And um, we we'll still continue to pour back into the hotels a great deal of our revenue each year. We've provided a lot of amenities to keep them up to date because uh, most of them, of course, are uh, range in age between 150 years old. But nevertheless, we, we are conscious of that we must provide new amenities to keep abreast of the market. What kind of thing are you doing? Well, for example, uh, uh, in our Mulrani Hotel, uh, two years ago, we provided a swimming pool which had the immediate effect of increasing our revenue there considerably. Then this year we followed that up at Bundoran. We provided the heated pool there, which enables uh, guests and visitors to have a swim in warm water. Do you find that the standard of accommodation and service demanded is increasing all the time? Yes, um, very much so. Um, even 25 years ago, hotels advertised room with hot and cold running water. Well, uh, I'm sure within the next five years that um, it'll be taken for granted that every room will have a bath. Well, how do the hotels tie into the CIE transport service? Well, we maintain very close liaison. We, we uh, have certain promoted um, tours. For example, Christmas, we run a combined uh, rail and hotel ticket, which is very popular. And uh, we, we run other uh, events, for example, uh, the Bundoran Lobster Festival, we, we organise at a rather attractive rate, a combined rail and hotel uh, weekend ticket. Yes. And you uh, get a lot of uh, business from the coach tours, don't you? Oh, yes. We, we, um, we, we maintain a terribly close link with the road passenger section and the commercial department on the uh, coach tours. In fact, our hotels are used more or less uh, where possible. Yes. Because we, we, we maintain the similar standard throughout. Coming back from Killarney, I made the acquaintance of that famous CIE speciality, the radio train. Larry Tracy, the compere, told me about it. The radio train is now an institution that has become that, and very few people come to visit Ireland without travelling on it. It's a train wherein 
People travel to go to Killarney, Galway, and all other famous beauty spots of our country. And en route, they learn a lot about the country, things they might not know otherwise. They listen to a lot of music, which is Irish and which is attached to various parts of the country. And on the return journey from these places, they have mixed musical programs, including uh, radio programs like request programs. And of course, we have a program which can be loosely titled the Visitors to the Microphone Program, where people come along, give us our views, their views, I should say, on our country, yeah. sing a song or two, and generally have a good time. You've been running this for how long? CIE's first radio train ran in 1949. Ever since that's been growing, and already this year we've had more radio trains running than ever before. Well, the, this train that we're on seems to be packed with visitors today. You must have met a fantastic number of visitors to Ireland over the years you've been doing it. Well, I'd say it's 95% this weekday, 95% uh, visitors to our country. We have 450 people on board. If we do this about five, six times a week at the max of the season. We meet about 2,000 visitors a week. goes on for about four or five months. And at the end of that time, you wonder, is there anyone left in the world you haven't met? Well, they certainly do sound happy. As you can hear, when Larry Tracy welcomes the visitors into the studio coach. It is my great, great pleasure to announce to you and to tell you that travelling with us this evening on this radio train, we have the Radio Train Mixed Voice Choir. <laughs> we also have a specially paid studio audience. So if we're, ready, if we're very well received, it won't be by accident. However, we do hope that you like it, and we hope you like it so well that you're going to join in with us. For an international choir, we must have an international song. So here's a song that was written by an American in English about Ireland. When Irish eyes are smiling, we'll sing it in three flats. We tried it in the other two. They were, they were thrown out, and we go on to the third, and here we go. Well, no. Back in Dublin, we get off the train at Amiens Street and go for the bus home. Still another CIE service. And if we were on the Swords route, our driver might be Mr John Brown, who has been driving buses in Dublin since 1925. His safety record speaks for itself. I hold up the wheel for 21 years, safe driving at the moment. From the Safety First From Association? From the Safety First Association, yeah. That's a very fine record to have. Tell me about the buses that you're driving now as compared with the ones you started on. Do, uh, uh, is it a better vehicle? Oh, they are. They're much better vehicles. They're easier to stop and easier to drive. They're much a better vehicle than the old type vehicle. Braking systems are better. Steerages are better. They're a vast improvement on them. Well, uh, after all your experience, if you uh, want, were asked to give any advice to private drivers in Dublin, what would you say to them? Well, I'd ask them for to try and facilitate bus drivers as much as possible. I know we're a bit of a nuisance pulling in and pulling out. And if they could assist us by, when we're trying to get out, to by letting us out, yes. it'd be a great help to us. Yeah. And if they keep well in to their own side of the road, on the left-hand side of the road, and leave ample room for bus traffic and other traffic to proceed. The man in charge of the Dublin City Services is Mr David Stewart, the Assistant General Manager of CIE and I asked him what Dublin City means in this context. Broadly, the Dublin City Services are covering an area of 15 miles of the Dublin Post Office. That itinerary is traditionally the Dublin City Services, 15 miles from the Post Office. That carries you quite far out, then? Oh, yes, quite far out. We have a number of uh, routes, of course, that go beyond 15 miles, Ballymore Eustace, Swords, Skerries, these actually arise from the fact that with acquisitions of independent operators during the years 1935, 45, a number of these companies operated beyond 15 miles, and the W United Tramway Company continued to operate the services operated by their predecessors. I see. Uh, how many vehicles do you use um, to keep this service going? The total number of vehicles actually scheduled each day are 630. And how many? 650, I believe. 650. Yes. And how many passengers do they carry? We carry approximately 700,000 people every day of the week. 700,000? Yeah. Well, do those come very much in two rushes, going to work and coming away from work? That is true. We have a very heavy peak period between about 8.15 in the morning to 9.10. 
and again in the evening from about quarter to five, rising to a crescendo, I might say, between half past five and six, and uh, tapering off very quickly after 6.15. Yes. There is also a more modest peak period uh, at lunchtime, hmm. partly due to the fact that quite a number of school children go home at that time, which rather add to our problems. Yes. Uh, what is your big problem, then, to have enough vehicles in service to handle the rush hour traffic without having a lot on your hands that yeah. you can't use efficiently, is that? The, the problem of any municipal transport service is the peaks. And it is true to say that the real cost of providing a municipal service is the need to provide for the demands of the people who are coming into work in the morning and going home in the evening. To give you an example of just the difference between a peak period and an off-peak period, or what we call a valley period, we are able to withdraw up to 200 vehicles in the forenoons, that is after yes. 10 o'clock in the morning, and again in the evenings, when there are very few people moving relatively to the number of people who are moving morning and evening peaks. Now, uh, you must sometimes feel that as the person in charge of Dublin Transport Services, you are the number one cockshy for everybody in the city, especially anybody who ever has to stand five minutes at a bus stop. And I wonder if, if you'd mind if I ask you a few of the questions that come up then. Do the Dublin ser uh, City Services pay? Uh, they do, yes. They pay in the sense that the revenue from the Dublin City Services is sufficient to beat all normal expenditure. Uh, do they uh, show a profit which is used to subsidise the country services? Well, of course, that's the sort of question which can uh, cause a certain amount of uh, doubt in people's mind as to what is meant by subsidy. I would say, in regard to Dublin City Services, that they make a profit. Uh, uh, first of all, they meet their expenses and they give a reasonable return in the on the capital invested. They do not. Uh, subsidise anything except in their own services. Some passengers feel that the fares in the Dublin area have gone up unfairly in recent years. Is there any truth in that? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I would say that in respect of the increases in the fares, the variation in the fares between 1938 and 1961, the increases, uh, the cost of transport to the ordinary user in Dublin City has not by any means outstripped the rise in the cost of living generally and in many directions the increase is considerably less than the normal rise in cost of living. Would it be true to say just that a lot more people are feeling the cost of transport because the city has spread out so much and many workers are living far out now? That is true, that is true and it has been said I think with some truth that when people plan, corporations and private builders plan uh, new housing areas they frequently overlook the fact that transport is a very material factor in the cost of the new housing area yes, to yes. the people who live there. You may have noticed all this time that we've been talking about moving people. More than half of CIE's job is moving goods. But that's another story, or rather another chapter of the same story, and we hope to tell you about it another time. Meanwhile, if the wanderlust is on you, sir or madam, your carriage awaits. Carriage Awaits, the story of CIE's passenger service was told by Jack White and produced by Brian Malone. Next week, Jack White will present The Fair to Parnassus, the story of the Arts Council. <laughs>